banks and shipping. It is really uh, the lifeblood of, of what kind of makes the economics of the business work. And so it's a really, it's a great privilege to, to have this panel and to hear from people from London and Singapore and all, and all over the world about kind of the state of market and what you guys see going forward. So come on up. So, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you, Michael, Matt, and Marine Money for the invitation, and for our distinguished uh, panelists as well. So, this is called Summit of Leading Global Banks Plus One, and I think we found the plus one now. Because <laughs> so, welcome. So, we have we have Holger Appel, who's the uh, global head of maritime industries at KFW Ipex Bank. Vasilis Maroulis, Global Head of Shipping at Citibank, Christos Takonas, Global Head of Shipping at VNB, Elias Katsoulis, Head of Shipping at Deutsche Bank, Abhishek Pandey, Global Head of Shipping at Standard Chartered Bank, and Ole Hertaker, who's the CFO of SFL. So, oh, sorry, what did I say? No, no. CEO, I mean, lots of uh, acronyms there. So. You know, as, uh, as Matt told us, we're, we're sort of looking forward here. You know, we're at a, at, at a time when many of the segments in shipping are at, you know, if not all time highs, at very, looks as though we're at the top of the cycle. So we want to look at the key issues affecting the industry and, and our financiers. So one of the key themes that we want to explore today is talking about managing risk at the top of the cycle. So I'd like to ask, you know, just make a small introduction. One of the criticisms that's been made in the past of financiers is that they're always there at the top of the cycle, but they disappear at the bottom. So, you know, how do we avoid this repetition? How do we avoid this pattern uh, repeating itself? Maybe we'll start with Vasily. Uh, well. So, uh, <laughs> thank you, George. Tough question. Um, I think, look, uh, it, it, it's always going to be the case that ultimately, you know, um, and each and every institution will have a different view as to how they operate within the cycle. So, for City, for example, what how we do things and how we analyze it is, you know, we are we look at the corporate, the corporate, the, and not so much the asset uh, that specifically. The, the, the specific company wants to finance. So therefore, for us, if the corporate, uh, the, ca the corporate cash flows make sense, then whether it is on the uh, upside of the cycle or the downside of the cycle, we are, and therefore that, you know, we are there to be able to finance. And that's why I think, as an institution, we are consistent. Now, LTVs can be different uh, during the, the various cycles, but I think, as a result of what has transpired over the past few years, I think the institutions that are still here providing finance uh, day in, day out, I think have learned from um, w what, has, uh, what has happened. And therefore, I do believe there is more consistency across the board. Okay. I mean, you, you say, you mentioned one thing there about people learning from the mistakes of the past or, or challenges they face in the past. But in this type of market also, you know, people are, people are concentrating, the global banks concentrate on the big corporates. But that, you know, we do see that pricing is coming down. So how, how, do, how do you manage that sort of balance between risk and, and pricing? I'll go to Christo for this one. 
First of all, I would like to add to what Vasily said. Uh, shipping is a very cyclical industry. Most of the institutions here, DNB included, you know, we have been around throughout the cycles. And you know, we've had bad markets for a number of years. So you know, we have a very good, uh, observed a very good track record of how people behave in a good and in a bad market. So it's easier to make a selection now and be active both at the top, but also at the bottom of the cycle. And I think you know, we, see, we see people differentiating. When it comes to pricing, uh, yes, competition is one thing that is pushing pricing down. With the Basel regulations, it's becoming more expensive for banks to lend to cyclical and capital intensive industries like shipping. Uh, and it's really the ability to offer a diversified offering to clients, cross sell, uh, do business over and above just bilateral lending or plain vanilla financing that can really enhance this profitability. We see that there is a race for the top. Yes, people are trying to do business uh, with the top names because it's a way to really smooth the cycle. But to make a return on those names, you need to have an offering over and above just lending to them. Otherwise, you can not just uh, make a return. Okay, thank you, Christo. And if I can direct the, so the same theme to you, Abhishek, as well, because you, you have a very global offering as well. How do you balance these risks when it comes to, you know, in a market such as this? So not very different, actually. The, the way we look at it is uh, through the four Cs nowadays, which is uh, client, cash, cargo, and climate, right? So which, which I guess all got covered. Chris just said, talked about, you know, uh, differentiating between people, how they behave. So that comes on to the C, which is the client, right? I mean, if you know the client, You've, you've, even if you don't know the client and you're approaching a new market, we're trying to do some business in Greece. We, we go around, we ask our counterparts and we get a feedback. Or if you have the vintage or the luxury of banking that client for 15 years, that's the first C. Then you go to cargo, uh, which is probably on the top of the cycle, becomes one of my prime uh, you know, kind of go-to points. You know, we've come, I don't know whether, whether all the bankers here have banked the offshore services industry, I have. And um, you know, floating assets get easily confused with uh, with ships, and uh, they service. They don't have cargo access. And when you come on the top of the cycle and you and you finance at uh, 70, 80 percent, and when the uh, when the services are not needed, there is no hard cargo to to catch. It becomes extremely difficult because the intrinsic value of the asset is as good as uh, the equipment on board, with with little steel in it. So that's the second uh, C. Then you come to the third C, which is the cash, and which links up with respect to leveraging up on the top of the cycle. So which, which I think Vasilya said, you know, uh, asset financing is great, uh, but at the end of the day, if you do not have corporate stroke, corporate cash to come and pay your debt service, you're gonna, you're gonna put stress on the bank. And you know what? Three years down the line or two years down the line, when, when you get hit by the, by the value maintenance clause, you will lose all the cash any which way because people will come for top ups. That's the third C. And then you come to climate, which I think we'll talk about a lot more in, in detail, which is our new way. I mean, if you can't join the journey with us in transition, I think you know, some of the old and the new clients would have to drop off. So, so that's how we manage risk and um, we very particular is all, all these things that we talked about. All right. So looking at that, I mean, banks in the past have, let's say, set volume targets for business. Um, does that change in, a, in, a, in this type of rising market? Is it, does it make any sense to have these targets in, in this type of market? And I'll direct that to you, Ilya. Thank you, George. Um, well, I think that <clears throat> that's probably a recipe for disaster in my view, uh, setting volumes, chasing business in a way that potentially could uh, um, make you do th things you don't want to do. Um, I think that's why, why uh, we see a lot of our credit fund clients being very successful because typically they're patient. And I think that's where banks historically have been uh, uh, a bit more aggressive in trying to chase volumes. I think in, in our case at Deutsche Bank, we, um, we won't just chase business just for the sake of chasing business. We will you know, do the stuff that were very well articulated before going back to you know, credit principles and um, trying to understand our client, trying to understand our business plan and determine whether it's something we can back. If not, then we, we won't do it. Um, I think that's our duty, not just to ourselves, to our shareholders, 
but also to the industry as a whole, right? Because um, that's, I think, what banks have to do is be disciplined um, and, 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 um, and, and help basically not, you know, create future problems for, you know, for ourselves as well as the industry as a whole. Okay. Thank you. And I'll just, I, I've got two questions, one for Holger, one for Ole, off the, off the back of what Elias just said, in terms of discipline. So uh, this is the first one is to you, Holger. In terms of discipline, what, it, what happens in these type of cycles, it hasn't happened yet, but if you see overordering. So if we see that if you've got a, a strong client, someone you want to bank, but you know, either they are overordering or they're in a sector that's overordered, how does that affect your decision making? Uh, I think first of all, um, looking at the bank's policy, I mean, we, we keep sticking to our boring business model long-term partnership, long-term lending, solid structures, top-tier companies, and so on, and that uh, obviously, that, that paid off. And um, um, before I answer your question, but what, 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 what my personal takeaway is, the ultimate proof of doing so was, most of you will know that we are, have a significant footprint in the cruise industry. How can you imagine an industry with zero revenues for about one year, and here I think in a very constructive and cooperative way we teamed up with the other banks and with the ECAs and found solutions for that very severe downturn. So I'm, I'm not that, that pessimistic about the future to come. We have seen consolidation on both sides, on the supply side, but also on the demand side, so that um, yes, um, what goes up must come down, <laughs> like Isaac Newton put it. Uh, but I think we, we're not going to see the same volatilities as we did in the, in the past. And of course, you have to be selective. And um, also referring to your question about uh, targets, the ultimate goal is the bottom line, and it's the profitability on your regulatory capital. And of course, that comes along with a de decent volume, but we're not chasing volumes. That's that's past. Okay, thank you. So all in all, based on what you've heard from the bankers, does that mean that you have an opportunity here? People aren't chasing volumes. People are looking at the, the top tier. Do, do you feel that this is a, a, a great opportunity for, for you? Well, yes, and thanks. And, uh, and first of all, I'm, you know, I'm the plus one here, yeah. which I assume is, uh, is, is because I'm sort of, sort of a toy boy at the panel. <laughs> you know, we, we get to pay the, pay the fees and uh, you know, pay, the, pay their way you know, in their nice lifestyles. No, I, I, but, I, but I do, but I, I have a background as a commercial banker, so um, I know a little bit, I know, I know a trick or two about how to manipulate a credit memo so, so, it, so it works, uh, you know, from a returns perspective. I think, you know, but just going back to that, I mean, f first of all, I mean, you, the business I run isn't really so much a financing, you know, institution, it's more of a long-term ownership, really tonnage provider to end users. So, so it's not like we will have a, you know, step in into sort of their market, but what we do see is that I would say the lease providers now ha have a much more, I mean, the, the, the market is really coming towards the lease providers because what we see, and we had a panel earlier. Sorry, oh, sorry, I was, oh, I was oh, sorry about that. No, we had a panel earlier where, where, we, where we discussed just that because what we see is that, you know, investors typically in lease providers or, or capital providers, they, they normally, as we see it, they have more of an absolute requirement. So their, call it their returns requirements, didn't come down with interest rates. So, so it became more challenging to be a, to be a financier or, or call it alternative financier in the market, you know, when the rates came down. But now when the rates are on the way up again, suddenly it's much more easy to be competitive without taking too much risk on. So, so, so that is changing, but I would say it's more of a symbiosis, uh, you know, between, between the banks and, and others. And I would say, you know, for us, I mean, the bankers here on the panel, all together, combined, would represent the 15th largest bank in our, in our, in our financings. So, because we do a lot more financing in Asia, I mean, we have a representative there, and we do proportionally very little in, in Europe and, and Scandinavia. And I think that has to do with structuring, you know, we have long-term charters, we find, what you say, we, we, we think we find, have found better structured financing uh, in Asia than in Europe over the last the couple of years. Okay. Thank you. Well, one, and just to sort of change topic now, because, it, and it's one of the things that you, Abhishek, uh, sort of prefaced when you talked about climate, because this is, this is a key issue. Uh, but now, now we're finding ourselves in an environment, until now, 
you know, everyone was talking about the energy transition, still, people still are, but now there's a balance with you know, the new buzz phrase is energy security. So, and, and there, there is a sort of, you know, there seems a different track or a different way that financiers look at this issue and the importance they attach to it and let's say the focus of owners. There's, that seems to be a slightly, you know, some competition there or, or differences in, in how it's viewed and the importance attached to it. So how, do, how does the industry now, how, how do your organizations balance these two competing demands? Because until now, this was, this was a key requirement and condition of financing. It's clear that your shareholders place, uh, attach a great deal of value to this. But what do you do in this period now where globally there is a bigger focus on, um, on energy security? So does, does the one, does transition, is transition paused? Is there less focus until we achieve security? I'll ask, yes, Abhishek. Thank you. No, I, I guess, uh, look, so about, we published a report a couple of months ago, uh, just in time, right? Uh, so about 94 point, and just, just you, uh, just so that people know, you know, our core footprints are Asia, Africa, Middle East, i.e. the emerging economies, right? So we, we anticipate that about $94.8 trillion is, is uh, required for that transition in these economies, right? Now, that's a huge number. It's got to come uh, from, from everywhere. So which means that it is a team sport, right? I mean, it is step one. We have to realize nobody else alone can do it. There's no chance. The step two uh, is that uh, you know, you're talking about the economies where actually, you know, the, the rate of poverty is much higher as compared to, uh, to this part of the world, which means that it has to be done in a just way. You can't just go and say, stop everything. And, uh, you know, so there, there has to be, to be a sustainable transition that needs to be facilitated. And that is very, very important to understand. The third part of it is collaboration. So it's a team sport. You know that it has to be just, it has to have ethics in it. And the third part of it is, is basically collaboration. A lot of times it happens that we all of us individually do pay the consultants, get the same studies over and over again, increasing the cost, not really sharing what we did, right? Unless and until it's, a, it's an IP, I think there is no harm, and, and we believe in it, in sharing you know, whatever work we did, got paid, uh, I mean paid to, to do, and then share with our clients. So I guess, that's, that's one part of it with respect to the urgency and the approach that we take. The second part of it is with respect to the, uh, you know, the energy security. In the way I look at it is that there are two groups, right? I mean, there is uh, who are de decarbonizing. There are economies or countries that are, you know, fairly ahead in the game of, of energy security. Um, and, and in that case, you know, you would see when you read the data that the decarbonization or the achievement of net zero is the pace is faster. And then you have got countries, including actually China, who have given themselves 10 years of leeway. 2050, the world goes, 2060, they go net zero. So it's called cognizance. I mean, they, they are fully aware that at the same point in time, it has to be done in a just way, in a reasonable way. They have given themselves a leeway of 10 more years. So it's not that that we will not, but it's, it's just because you know, uh, it needs to be done now and it didn't needs to be done faster. We do not support the clients. We have got a very simple theory that as long as you are ready to come on the journey with us and as long as you accept the steps that we said, we will, we will partner and we will make sure that we see the end goal together. So that's how we approach it. Okay. Christos and then, and then Holger wants to speak uh, as well on this. I, I think, you know, before, before the war, we had a very uh, a tremendous focus on energy transition. And I would say things were moving a bit too fast. We did not have the technology, but we wanted the net zero solution straight away. We felt a lot of stress as financial institutions as well. With the war, as you rightly said, the focus shifted to energy security. It doesn't mean we have taken our eye off the ball when it comes to energy transition, but we have a little bit more time to get there. And I think, you know, responsibly, together with our clients, we can do it. The big difference between banks and owners is that banks are getting organized. You know, we have the Poseidon principles. We are measuring the carbon intensity of, of our book. We are setting targets. Owners, the majority of our owners, they just don't want to pay. So they try to say, no, I, and, that, and that's the big issue 
with, uh, with the transition. People have to pay. There has to be collaboration across stakeholders. There will be costs that need to be shared across. And that's you know, what people need to realize. And the sooner we realize that, the faster the solution will be, in my, in my view. OK. I mean, without, and, I, and we'll go to Olga, but I mean, what, one thing that owners, you regularly hear from owners, is that, well, we'll bear the cost, but we're not, we can't provide the solution. And the cost ha has to be shared. And there's a feeling within the industry that the cost is, well, the owners consider it's primarily landing on their lap. What you have to, because you're having these discussions all the time. That's to you, Christo. Well, uh, oh, okay. Holger, you. although I'm a banker, I think I, <laughs> coming from Germany and Europe, it's uh, going to be a little bit of kind of a political statement. So, I mean, the, the, the 24th of February was a brutal wake-up call at least for my country and uh, many of our uh, fellow citizens in, 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 in Germany and, and Europe. And of course, um, we have to rebalance between uh, decarbonization and energy security. And it's, for me, it's quite impressive how fast and how pragmatic governments take action, in particular uh, now in, in Germany with, with uh, paving the way to have access to, to LNG and, and, and the likes. But still, my, my personal belief is that if what, what in essence do not only governments but also societies have to do about it, it's, it's safe, safe energy, so be m even more efficient, yeah, also out of the political situation, um, to replace the one by the other, and ultimately to transform. So th the simple truth that <coughs> climate change is, is taking taking place and that we, for the benefit of our, of our children and grandchildren, have to do something about it. it. It doesn't go away with this new additional challenge. And I find a lot of these things, that's why I use these three terms, save, replace, and transform, fully aligned with the <coughs> geopolitical um, challenges on one hand, but also the, the, the pathway to transform our societies and industries. And I'm fully with you that, of course, there are industries and countries more advanced, so they have to they have to lead, and of course we need a phasing of this transition uh, that has become crystal clear. Yeah, thanks. Um, you know, as an owner or uh, here uh, on the panel, you know what's also pretty frustrating is that you know there is a lot of of course good intentions, and you know I'm, I'm sure you know. The, the best idea is that th we, this should happen and should happen really fast. We have, for instance, now the EU, you know, emissions trading system that's in the works. You know, it may be implemented already partly from next year, but it's still completely chaotic on, on how it's going to be measured and who's going to be paying for it and who's responsible. For, for instance, right now, it looks like the owner will be pegged while it's really the charterer who pays for the fuel and who directs the vessel and tells what speed it should sail at. You know, they're, they're, they're not on the hook right now. So, so, that's the, and so, so from an owner's perspective, it's a little difficult to invest long term when you have, what you say, changing call it parameters, uh, you know, partly driven by politicians, sometimes partly driven by banks. I would say, I mean, for instance, on the, on the, on the Poseidon principle, you know, a great initiative. But sometimes you could argue that actually, you know, Financing a vessel that is 25 years and run it until it's 30 years may be the most uh, may be the most efficient way in reality instead of melting it down and build a new vessel uh, too soon just because it has a little lower emissions. Uh, you know when it comes straight from the shipyard. You see, this is the typical behavior. He doesn't want to pay, <laughs> so he complicates matters now. You know, <laughs> throwing different Alla. balls. So, uh, Ole, so, there's a <laughs> that, so you, you also have a very comfortable lifestyle, by the way. I would switch anytime. <laughs> but um, um, in, in terms of, I think, I think it's important to, to uh, say a few things. Number one, I do not think that this, the, the focus on transition has gone away. It's just that it's not as vocal as it was before the war. I think internally, as far as my institution is concerned, it's 100%, you know, it's, we're proceeding full throttle in, in, you know, as far as our CEO, for example, it was the first thing that, you know, in the first day, it was the, the transition to net zero. It's a focus, and I think it for all the institutions, it's the same thing. It's just that, yes, now, the, the, the war has changed uh, the rhetoric slightly, and therefore it's not as vocal, but it's proceeding full throttle, and people need to, uh, understand it, 
find a way to plot their course of action and what they're doing and be able to be vocal about it, so you know, think strategically about it and where they want to get to, right? The Poseidon principles, and many people have said, oh my God, you know, what about this, what about that, and all of that stories. The fact of the matter is, the Poseidon principles have provided you know, the necessary tools in order for the banks to continue to be in business and not in continuous receipt of attacks one after another. What are you doing? Why are you doing here on tankers and everything else? All of the banks here in this panel, including Citi, views things and analyzes things on a portfolio basis. And therefore, what does that mean? The portfolio needs to be on a trajectory, right? The trajectory is the IMO trajectory. It's something that all the owners, including uh, yours truly, need to abide with, right? Otherwise, you know, it, it is a slightly different story. So, if some, you know, for whatever reason, you know, 25 year old, and because it's a portfolio basis, usually the loan on a 25 year old vessel is much smaller than the loan on a brand on a new building. And therefore, but you, but you will lend on a 25 year old vessel. Yeah, I think, yeah, there is an exception. You're probably is, among, I don't think all, the, there all is your a, there colleagues is a, here will, uh, you know. No, no, no. Well, I cannot speak on behalf of <laughs> my colleagues, even though I do believe that they share the same views. You know, the, the fact of the matter is. Because it is a portfolio-wide approach, you can therefore adjust your strategy to every specific client, as long as the portfolio is on, on the trajectory that the bank has committed to. I, I, I think, think there are a couple, uh, sorry. Uh, I, I, you go, <laughs> right. I think there are a couple of things. First of all, it's not the banks that are driving the transition, and it's not the banks that are driving the net zero. It is the community, it is, you know, the people, it is investors, so it's something that's happening around us, and the banks are reacting to it. I think the Poseidon principles, first of all, is a way of measuring the intensity in the book. It's nothing more than that. It's a tool. It's like a yardstick. So you know how much you are emitting. And then, as Vasily said, you have to look at your portfolio, and you have to figure out how you allocate it, and how do you achieve the net zero ambition that your, your institution has set up. I firmly believe if we had not set up the Poseidon principles three years ago here, it would have been very, very difficult to be able to stand in front of our boards and justify why we are doing you know, shipping business, something that is perceived, maybe wrongly, to be you know, polluting and not really uh, be as environmentally friendly as people want it to be. The fact we have taken action early, the fact we can measure the carbon intensity of our book, the fact we have a trajectory to get us to zero, this is what enables us to continue being, being in business today. It, it, it's five against one here, so I'll, 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 I'll be a, a bit more measured. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, in, 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 in practice, for at least for our institution, like I echo some of the stuff that people here said, we, we haven't really changed any of our approaches uh, as to what we used to do before the war and, 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 and what we do now, but we've always been really pragmatic about the situation. and pragmatic by means of sitting down, understanding the client's plan, their business plan with respect to E as well as the E and S and the G, and working with them. And I think that's what we will carry on doing. Um, so I, I think a level of pragmatism is probably what needs to be kind of generally applied in, in the market. Can I say one thing? And, and that's not only because of you know, sea, cargo, sea cargo charter, but also what I'm seeing across uh, the groups that you know, uh, I, I, I speak to all the corresponding uh, business heads with regards to CNH. It is the charters and the customers of the owners, especially once we go into scope three emissions, that will be particularly tough with regards to um, the requirements. So, you know, one can say the banks and whatever else, but soon, and increasingly so, uh, I'm seeing it at least, you know, it is gonna be the charters that will be uh, totally focused on this. So what's important is not immediate transition to zero. That's not the, the, the target. What is, it, it is a thought process, it is a strategy, and it is, you know, how do we get there to be able to, be, you know, each and every customer to be able to articulate it to your banker in order for us who are the conduit 
to within uh, the banking system and the corresponding institution to be able to articulate it and therefore provide capital to support that strategy. And, and what, do you, what are you expecting or what do you want to hear from, and not just hear, but see from your, 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 uh, your customers in order to be persuaded that, that you know, th this is part of their strategy, they're building it into their strategy, they're taking steps to, to meet, you know, in the long term, the net zero uh, targets? I think, look, there are so, so many clients are taking totally different approaches and have totally different views as to what, the, what they need to do to be able to get there or how do they perceive they, they will get there. The, the, the fact of the matter is one needs to be able to articulate it, one needs to be able to withstand the counter arguments that, uh, that will be put forward and then see how... Uh, um I, I think hold your... Oh. Yeah, coming back to a remark of, of, uh, from, from Ola some minutes ago, I think I, I fully appreciate that um, we need a kind of a consolidation of or common approaches on what we are after. So um, we aim at the same target, but there are so many initiatives, so many tools, so many methods out there that it's sometimes overwhelming us, and of course it's overwhelming also our clients. And I think uh, that that's something which, which, which has to happen in, in the near future, and policymakers and regulators should also look at that. So that is my first remark. The second one is uh, you alluding to a very important point. So, I mean, we, we of course, we are happy to finance new bills but we also are a big promoter of financing retrofits because I, I, I always compare it to, to the, the housing sector. We cannot cope with this climate change issue just looking at the new stuff, but also doing something about the existing assets which still have a, an economic value, but you could improve the, the, the footprint by doing something about that, and that's something we really take seriously. Yeah, I think one of the, one of the things is that, you know, we are already assuming we are talking to savvy ship owners, right? Six and a half billion dollar book, Standard Chartered. About two thirds of the book is in Asia, quite contrary to all the other banks. You're talking to the clients and you are saying green tech. I'm talking to the clients and saying, what is Poseidon Principles, right? 28, 29 signatories in Poseidon Principles? count less than le maybe two, three fingers uh, in Asia. You, you, we are assuming in this room that people know exactly what decarbonization is, where you're headed. We are talking to people who still need to embark on this journey. They need to understand what decarbonization is. They need to get to Poseidon principles. They need to know what AER is, and that will take time. And, and what, 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 uh, what Holger just said is precisely the point. I mean, you yourself don't know what exactly is the new technology you are going to finance and say new buildings, methanol, biofuels, EV, I don't know. But the, you are talking to people who are trying to make a difference then and there. You know, how many of us go and say the retrofits, you know, engine power limiters, Shipoli, I'll do energy saving devices. You know, how many of us say that, you know, uh, we go down and, you know, we leave the asset, but we, whatever is needed to facilitate that asset to bring down the AER is what we're going to put capital behind, very few. And I guess that is, that, that needs to, that gap needs to be bridged uh, way faster than anything else because You've, you've got ship owners who are, who are actually 30, 40 ship owners who are sitting in, in Bangladesh, in Indonesia, in India. I mean, most of the banks don't finance there, international banks. And, and do you think you can get everybody decarbed uh, if, you, if you don't get them up the speed quickly? I think, I think the, one of the key prerogatives is that we make sure people are aware of what we are talking about and how it is measured, like Vasilis said. If you don't measure it, you can't manage it. So, so you have to have a tool to measure it and tell them that, yes, you can manage it, but by the time, hey, you go there, it's not only methanol ships which are going to cost you 30% more than what you're getting building today. There is, there is a transition strategy. There are, there are ways and means that need retrofits that can be done and can be financed. And, and I see it every day. Okay, thank you. So, Ole, are you feeling confident about the 25-year-old ship project? I mean, they're, they're standing in line here to fund it uh, now. Yeah. That, that, that aside, I mean, of course, when we, when we build vessels, we build them you know, for the life cycle. But on average, we typically own them 12 to 15 years and not much longer. It's partly also because the banks and the willingness to finance older vessels, it's going down pretty, pretty rapidly. Um, and, and as we all know, you know, you know, 
emissions or, or consumption, you know, which creates emission and, and speed is, is almost, uh, you know, it, you know, it, it, it's go like that as a, as a top deck. So it's, it's really just to reduce speed and, and you, will, you will massively reduce emissions and, you know, you will increase utilization of the vessels as well. Um, but my, my point there on the EU was that, you know, there are so many, I'm sure, the good intentions and, and, and they're scrambling to find a way. For instance, one of the things in, you know, in, 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 in the regulatory framework that they're discussing to implement now, they will measure tank to wake i.e. they totally disregard what happens to it before it comes onto the tank, for instance, the LNG, which will look phenomenally good if you measure it only from the tank and out. You know, doesn't look so good really if you measure it, you know, all the way from, from the well to wake. So, so there, and, and there aren't really any, any alternative energy, you know, with, with sufficient, you know, quantities out there to really replace it yet. Or, and, and you need a lot of energy to create some of the green energy, call it fuels that might come down the, down the line. So, so I think it's, you know, we just have to realize, you know, shipping is the backbone of the world. Uh, as you said, you know, it's really, you know, it's e so easy to sit in, in the US or Europe and think that, you know, we can, you know, everybody should do this and, uh, but, but uh, you know, it, it does cost money and, uh, and of course it's a huge fleet to replace if you, if you only want to finance new vessels. Is that it? So Mike, okay, we've run out of time, I'm, I'm afraid, with this very interesting discussion. I'd like to uh, thank all the panelists for expressing their views so clearly and uh, passionately. So it was, uh, and I hope everyone enjoyed it as well. Thank you. Thank you.